This is Dr. Herb Bateman in his instruction on the general letters. This is session number 21, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11 through chapter 3, verse 12. Living Godly Lives. Hi, my name is Herb Bateman. I'm here to uh, resume uh, uh, a... Uh, uh, looking at the book of First Peter, we um, we started last time by just looking at um, some of the implications and applic uh, and responsibilities of uh, being a, a believer in um, First Peter. Uh, this time we want to look at um, godly uh, living godly lives in society, living godly lives in society. And I see this, um, this running from um, uh, 2.11 uh, to 3.12. And of course, this is going to be broken up into several um, parts. But before I begin uh, looking at 1 Peter, I thought I'd, I'd read a little section from um, this book I wrote several uh, years ago or a couple years ago, Interpreting the General Letters. Um, I want to I read this uh, about the Greco-Roman culture and about living in society, in a Greco-Roman society. Uh, when uh, Caesar Augustus became emperor um, of Rome, he uh, rebuilt the temples, he revived historic uh, sacrifices and festivals, he, he strove to restore all, uh, old morals of the Republic. For instance, in 18 uh, BC, Augustus promoted family values by instituting strict laws uh, applicable to both men and women. He also issued laws uh, that gave preferential treatment to women who had three or more children. So the focusing on uh, women having children was very prominent in the, during his uh, reign. Inheritance laws uh, were rewritten uh, to restrict to whom childless families could leave their estate. Um, adultery became a criminal offense, believe it or not, um, uh, that was punishable by exile. And we see this, as a matter of fact, with uh, Claudius. Um, his wife committed adultery, and she, he exiled her uh, as a result. Um, confiscation of property and even execution uh, of the adulterer um, was possible. Uh, it was no longer a private family matter. It was a social one. In fact, during his time, um, the Romans believed that disorder in the home was a threat not only to the Greco-Roman family, but it also affected the Greco-Roman society. So what happened in, the Ro happened in the family affected society. And we see this in several writings. Um, uh, in a Platonic thought, um, it was believed the house is similar to a city in that both, according, uh, that both must have a ruler and those who are ruled. So as in, a, as in a society, you have a ruler and those who are ruled. Within a family, you have a ruler and those that are governed by that ruler. Aristotle, um, he considered authority and subordination to be necessary because the man is the most rational, the woman less rational. Um, uh, the child immature, and the slave irrational. Uh, Plutarch, uh, he, ha he avers that a virtuous household is carried on by both parties, husband and wife. Um, and uh, so there's agreement between husband and wife, but discloses the husband's leadership uh, and preferences. Um, regardless of uh, whether you buy into uh, Platonic thought, whether you buy into Aristotle's thought, whether you buy into Plutarch's thought, they all have one thing in common, and that is everyone in the Greco-Roman household was to perform his or her, or her 
assigned role in order that society would be orderly, strong, and prosperous. Now, um, when you, when you look at Hebrew scripture, when you look at Jewish writings, uh, you don't see any of these household um, rules uh, manifesting themselves in scripture uh, until the time of Judaism comes along and then they've got to grapple with the Greco-Roman society. Um, so this idea of the importance of family for uh, what happens in the family has impact for what happens uh, in, I mean, what happens in family ha has an impact on what happens in society, um, reveals itself here in Peter. Um, because what he's going to do in these um, verses, he's going to talk about godly living or living godly lives in society. And he's taking into consideration these Greco-Roman household codes. So the first thing that he um, deals with is um, he recognizes that Christians, followers of Jesus, are pilgrims. Um, uh, they are pilgrims in, in society, uh, but they have to do what is right and glorify God in the society in which they live. Um, and so one of the things that um, the author, or what Peter does, is he calls ch uh, the, the Christians um, pilgrims living within this Greco-Roman society. They're of the society, but you know, they recognize they, they, they have kingdom uh, residence elsewhere. Uh, they are to renounce sinful desires and practice good behavior among non-Christians. We are Christians, and we're, we're, we're pilgrims, we're aliens, uh, 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 you know, in this Greco-Roman society. But we still are to um, practice good behavior among non-Christians. So let's, let's see what um, Peter has to say in verses 11 and 12 with, with um, this regard. Um, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to keep away from fleshly desires that do battle against the soul and maintain good conduct among non-Christians so that though they now malign you as wrongdoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God when he appears. So he reminds them, first off, that uh, of their, con uh, their, uh, uh, their condition. They are aliens. In other words, they have no rights in the land where they live. Now, they are strangers, and they are only temporary residents. And, um, and just the reminder that this world is not the end all. I don't want to say this world is not my home, because I don't want to give the impression that um, you know, uh, um, that we aren't residents in this world. We are very much residents in this world, but we, we anticipate a greater kingdom. We anticipate um, uh, living um, with God uh, at, a, at a later date. Um, but he has placed us here, and this, this is his created order, we are part of this created order, even though we have been redeemed and we are a new creature in him. But as a result of that, we live differently. Um, uh, we, should, um, we should refuse the appeal of our desires, um, our, our desires that um, mimic a world without God. We are citizens of a kingdom. We are part of God's kingdom who follow a messianic king whose name is Jesus. And we, we are governed by that king. We are not governed by um, necessarily um, the passions and desires of the world. Our king has different expectations of us as far as conduct is concerned when thinking about the Greco-Roman world. And so he is recalling and asking uh, followers to recognize that they are to put off their fleshly desires, things like envy, um, hypocrisy, uh, slander. These are things that 
ought not to be part of the life of a kingdom saint. Um, these, are, these are evidences of the flesh. These are emphasis, emphasis of um, wrongful desires. Um, he oftentimes speaks of the inner man, the inner person. And of course, uh, that's in 1.9 and 2.25. And so when we yield to these inner urges of, of the flesh of sinful man, um, we become double-minded. And that's not what we're about. He says, make sure your conduct among the Gentiles, that is pagans, is good. with this intention. They might slander you. Uh, they slander you as evildoers. They may, uh, they may when they observing you, um, in order that in the matter in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, when observing you, glorify God in the day of his visitation as a result of your good works. Now, I, you know, I, I think this is really pertinent for us today. I, I sometimes I don't think um, uh, when we get involved in our world, sometimes there's not a difference between the way we live and the way the world lives. We, um, um, sometimes our good works get overshadowed, they get overshadowed by the way in which we do business in the world. Um, um, the manner in which we, we treat employees, um, uh, an employer treating an employee. Um, sometimes there's not a difference between the way in which a non-Christian employer treats a non-Christian employee or, or employee and the way in which a Christian employee teaches uh, treats uh, employees. Um, and there should be a difference. Uh, there should be uh, an ethical difference in the way in which uh, uh, employers operate and treat employees fairly, justly, uh, a fair wage for fair work. Um, these are good works. These are things that should manifest themselves in our everyday practices. Um, so um, the desire to uh, to gain wealth at the expense of your employees. They are evil, they are uh, inner desires. They are, they are desires of society that we ought not mimic. Um, capitalism at the expense of the people that, um, that work for you. The bottom line being the all in all. Uh, they, there should be some differences between the way in which a Christian carries on business and the way in which um, a non-Christian carries on business. So that people could look at a Christian employer and say, um, I can see a difference in the way you run your business. So the one thing is having to do with evil desires, keeping things in check. Uh, and one has to do with greed um, and, and uh, monetary gain at the expense of others. I think that would be one example. Another example has to do with uh, being citizens. Um, you know, once again, we want to come back to the fact that um, it's true that we, um, we have a citizenship as kingdom citizens. Um, we follow a king, um, uh, the messianic son of promise. But we still have uh, citizenship here um, on earth. And for us, uh, citizenship uh, in America, um, um, we, have, um, uh, we have dual citizenship. Let's put it that way. Um, and as uh, members of um, the United States, we're to be submissive to civil authorities for the, lands, for the Lord's sake. If you um, reside in England, then you're to be uh, submissive to um, the laws of Great Britain. If you live in Brazil, you are to be submissive to the laws of Brazil. Um, we are to be submissive to civil authority, not for our sake, but for the Lord's sake. Um, listen to what uh, Peter writes in verses 13 to 17. Be subject to have every human institution for the Lord's sake, 
whether to the whether to a king as supreme or to governors as those he commissions to punish wrong uh, or to governors as those he commissions to punish wrong doers and praise those who do good for god wants you to silence the ignorance of foolish people by doing good live as free people not using your freedom as a pretext for evil but as god's slaves honor all people love your brothers and sisters fear god and honor the king so here, we, this is, has to do with uh, constructions, um, our responsibility concerning Christian conduct within our societies, within the society in which uh, we live. Um, relationship to a state and state officials is quite clear. We're to submit to them. Um, the presence of political corruption should not blind us to the le legitimate role that gov of government under God. I, and I think... Um, I think we wrestle with some of these expectations that are expressed in verses 13 and 14. Um, God, uh, the general principle, is, the general principle is to submit ourselves to every human authority, uh, whether it be a king or to another authority. Now, this is rather significant when you stop and think about Peter. Um, he's writing to her at the time of when Nero is emperor. Um, I talked about Augustus. I don't want you to think Augustus is, is uh, ruling in Rome. Augustus was responsible for establishing the importance of family and how, that, how the family runs has an impact on society. We're, we're going to come back to some of the, the implications of that, um, uh, that, um, that model that he sets up when he first became Caesar. The, the man who is in control of the Roman Empire at this point the Greco-Roman society uh, of, the, of, the, of the Roman world is Nero. And he isn't one of the most um, um, uh, uh, God-honoring uh, uh, Caesars uh, 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 by any means. Um, uh, uh, he's irrational in many ways. He's um, uh, very um, destructive in the way in which he rules and the way in which he governs. Um, so, uh, so Peter is saying, I mean, so he's, he's living under a, a Roman Caesar that is not known for his um, honesty. Um, and he's saying, regardless, be submissive to the king or to governors that are sent by the king. Um, because they're there to govern, uh, to protect uh, wrong, uh, people from wrongdoing. Live as free people, and don't use your freedom uh, uh, as a covering for wrongdoing. So in, so in the context, Peter meant that by obeying the law, we can alleviate unnecessary and illegitimate criticism. Now, um, this idea of live as free people and do not use your freedom as a covering of or for evil, I, I think is pretty relevant for um, Christians um, in, in a society as free as ours. Uh, we have the freedom to, to um, um, object uh, without punishment. We have the freedom to um, to uh, protest, but um, but when when that freedom um, overflows into uh, breaking the law or acting um, uh, in ways that are just even unbecoming for uh, a, a Christian saint, then then we um, then we're disobeying what what Peter is saying here. We do have freedom to protest uh, here, but when that protesting involves hurting others or killing others, um, there were times when um, uh, individuals who protest abortions and abortion clinics, uh, there have been on more than one occasion where an abortion clinic would be bombed uh, by a Christian. 
Well, now you're using your freedom uh, for evil, uh, trying to use freedom to cover evil. Well, uh, for a supposed greater good. Um, uh, Peter is saying that ought not, not to, be, to be happening. Um, when we think about um, uh, submission to um, uh, governing powers, we are supposed to honor, uh, we are supposed to show respect for all people, um, especially um, governors. We are to accept uh, on the basis of what Jesus did for us. Um, and we are free from tyranny. We are free from the, the tyranny that Satan brings. We're free from the tyranny that our rulers should be. But we should not use this freedom as a, as a, a right to sin uh, on supposedly behalf of God. Um, I think we need to keep those type of things in check. Um, I think we have great opportunities to vote things down. We have great opportunities to speak our mind. But when, um, when we disagree with what government has to say, and we don't particularly care for a particular law, um, we still have to honor it. Um, we have freedom in Christ. We have freedom, and, uh, but we still have that obligation to honor uh, the laws of our land. We have the obligation to honor uh, human resource laws. Uh, we have the obligation um, to honor um, uh, the Supreme uh, Court's laws. We may not agree with them. We may not agree with the uh, Roe v. Wade, Wade law. We may not disagree with the most recent discussion concerning gay marriage, but it has become the law of the land. So how do we function? Do we use our freedom to continue to be obstinate? Um, I think when we do those type of things, we, we draw unnecessarily attention to ourselves and, um, and um, discredit the kingdom and show ourselves to be Evil doers, just like any normal criminal, and we're not. We're to be different. We are to be submissive to civil authority, whether we agree it or to it, with it or not. The next thing that um, um, Peter uh, deals with is um, he deals with um, how do I, as a slave, serve a master, um, even when it involves um, undeserved suffering. Um, now, this occurs in verses 18 to 20, and I'll, I'll read these passages. Then I want to come back and um, talk about them. And I think what I'll do is I'll look at those passages, and then I'll, um, and then I'll talk about the examples that follow. So 18 to 20, we read, Slaves, be subject to your masters with all reverence, not only to the good and, and gentle, but also to the perverse. For this finds God's favor, if because of conscience toward God, someone endures hardships and suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if you sin and are mistreated and endure it? But if you do good and suffer and so endure, this finds favor with God. Okay, so the first thing we have is um, uh, believers are told to submit um, to their to masters. Believers who are slaves are to submit to their masters, uh, for this is um, grace, and it will find favor with God. I mean, God knows. Uh, that's verses 18 and 20. Then... Uh, Peter follows up with how believers are to submit to their masters, for this is what they were called to do. God expects slaves to submit to their masters. That's what God expects. And then believers who are slaves are to submit to their masters uh, because they have returned uh, to the shepherd and overseer of the souls. Uh, for what credit is it if you sin but if you do good and suffer and so endure, this finds favor with God. Believers are submit to the masters because 
uh, for they have returned to the shepherd and overseer of their souls. God knows and, 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 uh, and would be record, rewarded accordingly. Now, one of the things that typically happens with this passage is that we look at this passage um, as though uh, an employer-employee relationship within, this, within our 21st century here in the United States. Um, I, I think that's... Um, um, I struggle with that because um, we can always quit our job. A slave had no rights. Um, if you were born into slavery, um, you had no right. Uh, you, uh, you were committed to your master unless he sold you or granted you freedom. Um, you were a slave. Uh, uh, the master's personal character or conduct is not the reason for disobedience. Um, we, uh, a slave, regardless of how bad that master was, that slave was to obey um, his master um, because it was God's will. That's what God desired. Um, and if it includes suffering, well, that's Part of what it means to be a believer is to suffer. And so Peter is saying, if you're a slave, you have to be submissive to your master. And if that master is bad, you still need to be submissive to him. And if it involves suffering, well, that's what being a follower of Jesus is about to begin with. And so he's, he is saying that slaves were to submit to their masters. Now, we, we try to make this connection with um, employees, with employers. And I sometimes think we, we forget that we can always quit our job if you don't like your employer. Um, you can say, all right, well, I'll find myself another job. Um, some of us feel locked in to our jobs because of um, um, you may be the sole breadwinner, you, uh, you may be locked in because of insurance and having health insurance. These are things that, that might lock us in and make us feel as though we have no options. But in, in our society here in America, we do have the option um, to find another job. We aren't really slaves as this uh, context demands. Um, but by the same token, even though there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence, um, there is a sense, though, that as uh, an employee to an employer, we do have the obligation to honor that relationship, even though we can step, and walk, step away and walk out of any uh, work uh, environment here in the United States. Uh, I guess, I guess, unless you're locked into some type of prostitution ring, I guess that's one thing that comes to my mind where you would be locked in and a lot more difficult to walk away from. But for the most part, we can walk away from it. But I, so I, I don't want to draw a one-to-one -one correspondence, but I do want to recognize the fact that when we accept a position and we work for an employer, um, we are obligated to um, obey him. Um, there are laws that protect us uh, here from hostile work environments. Um, and uh, there are laws that protect from any um, sexual harassment. There are laws that protect um, uh, indiscriminate hiring. There are laws that protect us that never existed in a slave master environment. Um, there are things that are in place in our society that um, do protect the employee, um, though at times um, there are ways in which employers can get around it uh, for whatever reason. But hopefully that is not the case for a, for a master or an employer to abuse HR privileges. Um, so I, there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence, 
However, the emphasis that I think I want to make at this point is the fact that as employees, we are responsible to obey the employer uh, that we work for. Now, having talked about a slave master situation, um, we, we move to um, Christians being called to trust and obey God while suffering unjustly. And we see this in verses 21 to 25. 21, for to this you were called, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example for you to follow in his steps. He committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. When he was maligned, he did not answer back. When he suffered, he threatened no retaliation, but committed himself to God who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we may live, uh, may leave sin behind and live for righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed, for you were going astray like sheep, but now you have turned back to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. So here we have um, uh, uh, a reason being given for slaves to obey. Uh, the first part dealt with slaves' um, uh, expectation to be subject to their master. Now Peter is going and providing um, some examples for why a slave is to be obedient to his master. Um, so the first thing is he, uh, the, the, the supreme reason, the ultimate reason is because uh, not only is Christ the answer to their hope, but he is the example to follow. Um, he followed, he was obedient to his um, uh, governing powers uh, to the point where he um, died and um, was without sin. And he didn't do anything wrong. He was found guilty um, uh, by false accusations and was put to death um, because of uh, slander, because of jealousy, because of misunderstanding. Not because he broke the law, but because, the, because of the uh, religious leaders and political powers that be at the time uh, found fault with him, though there was nothing that he did that was warranted death. Um, he didn't hurl insults at his tormentors. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he committed himself uh, to uh, the righteous judge. He committed himself to God. Um, he committed himself to God who judges rightly. And I think, that's, I think that should be encouraging to those of us who may find themselves in situations where we've been wrongly accused, or um, uh, um, have suffered ill um, because of slander or whatever reason. Um, I think we should strive to clear things up, try to clear your name, but sometimes it ain't going to happen. But you know God knows and he'll take care of it in his time. Uh, there are times when perhaps we may need to go to our court system. I, I am not a believer in thinking that, uh, that uh, just because you're a follower of Jesus, um, you can't use the courts to make sure that um, things um, uh, don't get handled justly, particularly within uh, Christian cultures. A lot of times Christian leaders unfortunately use the statement from Paul, Christians don't sue Christians as a means to, uh, uh, to uh, keep a thumb on you. But I, th you know, th that, uh, I think that passage gets abused. I think, we, I think there are times when perhaps we need to maybe uh, use the courts to protect us. But for the most, time, most parts, Christians tend not to use the courts. And when Christians suffer at the hands of another Christian, um, they take great loss, whether it be personally, whether it be emotionally. 
But God knows, and he's the just judge. In much the same way Jesus suffered and he did nothing wrong and suffered death, this passage is telling us uh, he committed himself to the righteous one. He committed himself to God. And God will judge that in due time. And then he talks about how Jesus in his suffering bore our sins. He died so that we may ease, uh, may cease from sinning and live for righteousness. And then talks about it's by his wounds that we have been healed that enables us to, to live that way. Part of the Christian calling in verse 21 is to suffer. We are called to suffer. And Christ is the ultimate example of what and how we ought to go about suffering. Finally, uh, he moves into talking about, uh, well, not finally, but uh, we're, we're getting to the end. He moves to talking about Christian wives and, um, and their submissiveness to their own husbands. We see this in uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And... Um, uh, let me go ahead and read those um, verses to you. In the same way, wives are to be subject to your husbands. Then even if some are disobedient to the word, they will be won over without a word by the way you live. When they see your pure and reverent conduct, let your beauty not be external, the braiding of hair and wearing of gold or the fine, of fine clothes, but the inner person of the heart, the lasting beauty of a gentle and tranquil spirit, which is precious in God's sight. For in the same way the holy women who hoped in God long ago adorned themselves by being subject to their husbands, like Sarah who obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, you become her children when you do what is good and have no fear in doing so. There are several things that are um, uh, interesting in this passage. Um, first off, in the same way, refers back to a spirit of submissiveness uh, that we saw earlier in this passage. Um, submissiveness to uh, government and, uh, for, for example, every institution be subject to. Here we got uh, wives being exhorted and encouraged to be submissive to their husbands. Um, people that are in direct authority are to be submitted to. Uh, now, oftentimes, um, I think we we miss some rather important um, nuances in this passage because I don't think we always fully understand the um, Greco-Roman culture in which these uh, wives are living. Um, one of the things that's interesting, um, uh, First off, there are, I think there have been some misunderstandings in the way in which this passage talks about not wearing uh, braiding of hair or fine uh, jewelry or fine clothes uh, to perhaps be misunderstood that, uh, we need, that our wives need to be plain Janes. Uh, that's not what this passage is talking about. Um, there are pendulum swings. Um, I think there's a sense of modesty in the way in which you dress and the things that you wear. Um, I think another um, point that gets um, uh, uh, misnuanced concerns uh, authority. Uh, and, and, and Peter actually, in some ways, ch is challenges the Greco-Roman way of thinking. Um, let's just think about uh, the authority in the household during the Greco-Roman period. It resided in the male, predominantly the the, the husband was the head of the wife, and he was control of all family affairs. Household codes endorsed a man's rule over his wife. It endorsed the man's rule over his children. It endorsed the man's rule over his slaves, uh, Philo, 
was a proponent of this. Uh, even Josephus, the Jewish historian, uh, Stroh uh, mentions this and identifies the fact that um, uh, they, they try to align themselves as writers to these Greco-Roman, this Greco-Roman atmosphere. Um, they even argue that these codes existed prior to the Greeks and even during the time of Moses. Um, so in what way does Peter align himself um, when, in this passage? Well, using the same categories of those steeped in the predominantly Greco-Roman culture in the geographical areas like Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, um, uh, and the province of Asia, uh, Peter engaged his Greco-Roman culture in ways that both adopted and yet amended some of these household ethics uh, for wives and slaves in order to transfer form culture. So not only are wives and slaves elevated, because Peter puts, he identifies them as being part of God's kingdom, uh, Peter puts household relationships on an entirely new footing. Um, the subverts of moral code as perversely taught by Greek philosophers. On the one hand, Paul, uh, Peter alters culture by elevating the dignity of both the slave and the wife. He says to all, live as free people. They're to live as free people though they are to submit to society, though they are to submit to their masters, though they are to submit to their husbands. All have been recognized previously as being free uh, within their cultural setting. So we have this, um, we have this idea where Peter is, is in some ways challenging um, culture. Live as free people, not as a pretext for evil, but as slaves, as God slaves. So you are free, but don't use that freedom to subvert and be unsubmissive to those to whom you are obligated to obey. Whether a person was a husband, master, wife, or slave, all are to subject themselves to God. All are slaves. All are subject to God. Addressing the husband, he muses, treat your wives with consideration as the weaker partners and show them honor as fellow heirs of the grace of life. Well, that wasn't part of the Greco-Roman code. Wasn't, wives were just to submit to their husbands. There's nothing saying how he was supposed to treat her. On the other hand, the wife is not expected to worship the gods of the husband. In the Greco-Roman culture, when a wife marries into a family, she assumes the worship of his gods, those family gods. Um, so the worship of gods of the husband or master is expected among other Greco-Roman households. If you're a slave and, you, and you're in a household, you're supposed to worship your master's gods, but that's not at all being encouraged and enforced here. Um, uh, Plutarch uh, affirms this. It is becoming of a wife to worship and to know only the gods that her husband believes in and to shut the front door tight upon all queer rituals and outlandish superstitions. In 1 Peter, Peter tells the wife, that the wife is independent enough from her husband to choose her own God. Peter argues that the way for her to win over her spouse is to follow the example of women like Sarah. And who were these women? Who was Sarah? Well, she was a holy woman who hoped in God long ago uh, uh, adorned themselves by being subject to their husbands. There is no worshiping of her husband's God here. Peter's not telling the wife to worship the gods of her husband, but rather to submit herself to her husband in order to win him over to her God. That was counterculture. 
Peter was adopting and modifying the authoritarian Roman household ethic for wives and slaves and community. Um, so on the one hand, Peter is encouraging and enforcing the Greco-Roman codes by talking about submitting to Roman leaders, submitting, submitting to masters, submitting to husbands. But in that submission, Peter recognizes that all people are free in Christ. And all people are subject to Christ as slaves. And so there's equity between people. There's equality between the king, the master, the slave, and the woman, children. Because all are free in Christ, and ultimately all are enslaved to, are all God's slaves. So when ultimately Peter's perceived sense of equality within Messiah's kingdom between Jesus' followers, that was unequaled in Greco-Roman world. So there's a, a, a lack, for lack of a better word of saying it, and I know that better way of saying it, I know this is a loaded term, there's a sense of egalitarianism within this Greco-Roman world that Peter is alluding to, but recognizing that though there is this equality among all believers, there is this responsibility of all believers to be submissive to the one who is over them. So wives would be submissive to their own husbands, but with a, with a cultural caveat, uh, a, a nuancing of of that submission in light of, of the fact that we are members and citizens of another kingdom. And there's a sense in which there is a, a, re, a, a redemptive thing going on within the kingdom that makes all people um, equal in God's eyes. And there's no uh, classification or uh, stratification that separates and makes one person more equal than another, except in the fact of how uh, we relate to our bosses and our, uh, and our uh, governments. And perhaps I could say that better, um, but um, I've said it and we'll move on. Uh, but it is something to think about. I, you know, look, we, we all have to wrestle with, with the text. Um, we all have to um, look at what the text is saying, hopefully um, as objectively as possible, but, but no one can approach this text of scripture with total objectivity. We all have blinders on. Um, but um, I'm not asking you to buy in to my, some of my thoughts here necessarily. I'm just asking you to consider them. Um, give some thought to them. Um, I spell this out a little bit more detail uh, with um, other sources you can look at in this interpreting the general letters. But uh, in the, I deal with this uh, with regards to Peter and the household codes in the chapter on the background for the general letters. Um, pick it up, read it. Um, Karen Jobes uh, was influential in my thinking uh, through some of this. And there are other articles uh, that are out there that might cause you to rethink Peter. But Peter is, is, um, is looking at uh, the, um, the role of women in a, in a different way than typically this passage is preached and taught. Um, um, and so it's just think, something to think about. The last thing uh, that uh, he deals with or the next to the last thing is concerning husbands and how they're to treat their wives. And here again, it's with understanding and honor. Verse 7. Husbands, in the same way, treat your wives with consideration as the weaker partners and show them honor as fellow heirs. Here again, a sense of equality, a sense of fellow heirs. And show them honor as fellow heirs of the grace of life 
in this way, nothing will hinder your prayers. Wow. See them as fellow heirs. See them as your equal. I, I, I'm not saying that. Scripture is saying that. Next, we want to look at uh, a conclusion. He brings us all to conclusion in verses 8 through 12. Finally, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, affectionate, compassionate, and humble. Do not return evil for evil or insult for insult, but instead bless others because, here's the reason why, you were called to inherit a blessing. For the one who wants to love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from uttering deceit. And he must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the Lord's face is against those who do evil. Christians are to regard themselves, um, their status, uh, uh, as people living righteously, living both sides, both inside and outside of the Christian community. We are to be living righteous lives in the church and outside the church. Um, uh, there should be no difference by the way in which we live. Um, so uh, Peter is concerned with how we, um, we live in our societies. And um, we should be living in ways that um, renounce um, sinful desires, that uh, reveal submission to our civil leaders, uh, submission to those with, uh, that we work for, though quite a bit different than being a slave. And then finally, uh, submission is oh, uh, concerning how we, um, we live with each other. Um, Peter doesn't say um, that, um, uh, doesn't quite say it the same way Paul does in Ephesians, but it comes pretty close. Uh, wives, submit to your husbands, and, and, uh, but re retain your right to worship your God. And, um, and yet, when talking to uh, husbands, husbands are to uh, treat their wives with honor and fellow heirs. There's a sense of equality between husband and wife, I think, that we tend to overlook uh, in some of our evangelical circles. And I'm sure... I'm going to get some emails about that. But that's OK. Um, I reserve the right to be wrong. And I also reserve the right to grow if I am. So I trust that you will uh, take to heart some of the things that we looked at. Some of these uh, issues are not the easiest to work through. But I challenge you to be lifelong learners and to check out some of these uh, issues uh, on your own. In the meantime, walk with the king and be a blessing. This is Dr. Herb Bateman in his instruction on the general letters. This is session number 21, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11 through chapter 3, verse 12. Living Godly Lives. Mm -hmm.